the discovery of a head placed outside a school in Kobe, Japan in 1997 caused outrage and shocked the international community. The heavily mutilated head belonged to a recently missing boy. As the investigation heated up, the killer began to send letters to the authorities, taunting them into action. But the most shocking part of the case is not the violence used or the lack of remorse. It's in fact that the killer was just a boy himself. What police uncover about their main suspect will make you sick to your stomach as we explore the case of the 14-year-old Japanese kid who decapitated two of his friends, also known as the Kobe School Killer. The descriptions of the crimes in this video are pretty hard going, so if you might be sensitive to that kind of content, then maybe you can check out one of our latest videos. え、神戸市幕の小学6年生長谷淳くんが殺害された事件で、兵庫県警捜査本部は今夜7時過ぎ、遺体の頭部が見つかった中学校に通う14歳の少年を殺人などの疑いで逮捕しました。え、100人から200
Neighborhood watch groups were set up, and parents escorted their children directly to the school and back again, as fear ruled not just across Kobe, but the whole of Japan. Then, on June 28th, the main suspect was caught, and the country was rocked with horror to find out the killer was a 14-year-old boy. Kobe but who was this mysterious suspect? And how did one young individual turn into such a cold-hearted killer? All the answers came in the form of a diary the killer had kept which contained the most sick and twisted confessions of his desire to take human lives. What police discovered sent shockwaves across the world. Worst of all, the signs that there was a murderer in the making were there all along. Born on July 7, 1982, this killer's real name would remain a secret by the Japanese judicial system, known only as Boy A. Although his real name was released by a Japanese tabloid, for today's case, we will refer to him under the name he gave himself in that second letter, Seito Sakakibara. He was described as unpopular in his local neighborhood, and his behavior would only become more unhinged the older he got. Social workers had warned his mother about some of the signs they had seen emerging in her son, even describing him as mentally unstable. Despite the warnings, his mother did nothing. His fascination with death is reported to have begun after his grandmother passed away in 1993. His morbid curiosity would eventually become more experimental and deadly. While still in school, he began carrying weapons and wrote in his diary about how this made him feel, explaining, I can ease my irritation when I'm holding a survival knife or spinning scissors like a pistol. And as we have seen in many cases, animals will be the first target of this killer and he would take their lives in the most cruel way. Starting with frogs, he soon progressed to bigger animals, and his experiments became more grotesque. Cats were torn apart, and pigeons were beheaded. To Seito Sakakibara, this was merely a hobby, or a game, as he has put in his letters. Reportedly, he wanted to experience death itself in order to understand it. The more he experienced it, the more he liked it. As he wrote in his diary, When I advanced to junior high school, I had already become bored of killing cats and gradually found myself fantasizing about how it would feel to murder human beings like me. He would embark on a violent spree that would end up leaving two innocent children dead and a nation in shock. February 10, 1997, and two school kids would be confronted by a strange young boy approaching them with a hammer. The ferocious attack would leave his two victims with injuries, but thankfully, they survived the ordeal. His next target was not so lucky. Ten-year-old Ayaka Yamashita was hit repeatedly with an iron bar on March 15th as Seito tried to feed his hungry appetite. With her was nine-year-old Kasumi Ishikawa, who was stabbed in the abdomen as the nature of the assaults grew more severe. Kasumi would survive, but Ayaka would need serious medical attention, and she would end up in hospital and clinging for life. Seito even made a diary entry the following day, and it shows how unhinged the mind behind the murderer really is. As he writes, I carried out sacred experiments today to confirm how fragile human beings are. I brought the hammer down when the girl turned to face me. I think I hit her a few times, but I was too excited to remember. Sadly, Ayaka Yamashita would not survive and succumb to her traumatic injuries just days after the attack. When Seito heard the news, he headed straight for his diary, proclaiming, This morning, my mom told me, Poor girl, the girl attacked seems to have died. There is no sign of my being caught. I thank you, God Bamoi Doki, for this. Please continue to protect me. The same day he attacked Ayaka, he stabbed another girl, and only a few hundred meters away from where Ayaka lay injured. She was another lucky survivor of the Kobe child killer. And in a disturbing twist, mutilated animals were found near the scene, just like there were at the school gates during that first grim discovery. 
It was a survivor of the knife attack that eventually helped police identify the guilty party and bring him to justice. His own diary entries not only served as a confession, they also contained the same handwriting as the letters received by the media, and details of the crime that has not been released by police at the time. As a shocked nation came to the realization that the Kobe child killer was only a child himself, Saito decided to show the authorities exactly how he had killed Jun Hase, in every sickening detail. The descriptions of what happened to Jun Hase are among the worst you will ever hear. That fatal day in May, Saito had managed to convince his victim, Jun, to follow him to a place that was known as Tank Mountain. The location was meters away from the school, so if Saito was going to kill his victim, he would have to ensure it was done quietly. He showed police how he struck the boy on the spot. Wanting to cover up his actions, he then hid the body until the next day. When he returned, he came armed with a garbage bag and, more worryingly, a handsaw. Seto would take what dignity his victim had left and strip him of it by mercilessly cutting off his head. He then hid the body, but he hadn't finished with Jun Hase yet, and he would need to take the head home to enact the next part of his sick game. He later told police he had played around with the head before violating it. Then he cleaned up and began to disfigure the head. As well as removing his eyes, Jun Hase had slits from his mouth to his ears. And maybe most twisted of all, he claimed he drank the blood of his victim. It's difficult to imagine someone so young having such violent, evil tendencies inside them. The signs have been there, but for whatever reason, no one chose to intervene. And now the consequences were clear. There was no doubt in the mind of the investigating officers that they had their suspect, and plenty of evidence to back them up. But some were not so convinced, and several concerns were raised around certain contradictions from the investigating team. One major red flag was the fact that police had said the killer was left-handed, when in fact, Seto was right-handed. Were these discrepancies enough to stop this going to trial? No. He would face his day in court and be made to answer for his crimes. But the Japanese judicial system would make a very controversial decision that would have serious implications on the future of Japanese law. Being under 16 years old, Seito Sakakibara was simply too young to face an adult trial. Even with the violent, brutal acts he committed, the law would still protect him. Instead of facing the rest of life in prison, or the most likely outcome of the death sentence, he was sent to the Special Medical Reformery for Juvenile Offenders in Fuju, Western Tokyo. There, he would receive psychiatric treatment and counseling. He was transferred to an ordinary reformery in November 2001, where he would learn social skills before returning to the medical reformery in November 2002. This was not well received across Japan, and an angry nation would demand changes to the law, and bowing to pressure, the age of criminal responsibility was dropped from 16 to 14. Many feel angered that only six years into his incarceration and treatment, he was deemed cured of his violent tendencies and was released under supervision. The now 21-year-old was free on a provisional basis, with a full release on January 1, 2005. The parole board who granted the release later said, The board has interviewed the man on previous occasions and closely examined his correctional state. We came to conclude that psychiatric care and correctional education of reformeries have obtained good results. The Japanese judicial system also released statements regarding the successful parole, which is an unusual move. They stated that, Considering the peculiar and grave nature of his crimes, we thought public cooperation for his rehabilitation is essential. In fact, there were strong calls for Seito to be transferred to an adult prison to serve out a longer sentence. Even his own parents were painfully aware of how his freedom would stir up many negative feelings, and made a statement through Seito's lawyer, where they said, Our son is now doing his best to have courage to plunge into the world of anxieties and uncertainties. I believe there will be a long and tough road ahead of us and our son, but if possible, I hope the public will watch over us quietly. His father also hoped that his son would learn from his experiences, but hoped the severity of his actions must never leave him. Seto's lawyer tried to reassure the nervous public by saying, He now feels he wants to make up for having taken people's lives. 
He has grown up a lot in a short period of time. I am not worried about the possibility of repeat offenses. The argument for change was stirred up once again just months after his release, when another child, only 11 this time, went on a slashing spree. This latest shocking crime meant the recently reduced age for criminal responsibility would need to be reviewed once again. The victim's families were notified of his whereabouts, but as of 2004, less than 10 years after his barbaric crimes, Sato was no longer required to report his location, and soon he disappeared from public view altogether. In 2015, Seito Sakakibara would make the decision to write an autobiography about his life, and this would prove to be a very controversial choice. The book, entitled Zeka, would appear on the bookshelves without informing the victim's families. The publisher of the book made a statement in order to justify the publication, where they said, We have never had the opportunity to read the personal account of a juvenile criminal at this level. Although I understand this book will receive a great deal of criticism, I believe that the book details events that speak to issues of juvenile criminal accountability still relevant today. Jun Hase's family objected most of all, and along with several others, they tried to block the book from hitting the shelves. In their horror, it was put on general sale. And worse than that, it would hit the bestseller list, meaning the whole world could read details that had not been heard before. Jun Hase's father could not stay silent, and also released a statement in which he declared, I don't know if the murder of our child published this book to further extend our endless suffering. It shows he doesn't really feel bad about doing what he did. I wish this book would be pulled immediately and no more copies would be printed. The graphic descriptions of what he did to his victims made hard reading for anyone. He described what he did to Jun Hase as far more heinous than murder. If the book wasn't a crushing blow to the families of the victims, then the fact he received royalties must have been. And in yet another twist to the tale, Seto had allegedly written a note of apology and attached it to copies of the book, which he intended to send to members of the families his crimes have affected. But this was not the end of this bizarre case, when just a few months after the book came out, a disturbing website appeared. The website is named Sonzai no Tairare Nai Tomeisa, meaning the unbearable transparency of being, went online later in 2015, and it was an unusual website that only seemed to feed Sato's ego. In its web pages were strange photoshopped images that Sato claimed were of himself, described only as five foot four inches tall, 120 pounds heavy, and suffering from delusions. The images he posted are perhaps another view into the mind of someone who is capable of such mindless m One newspaper took offense to the publicity this anonymous was receiving and decided people should know the new identity of one of Japan's most notorious criminals. They released his name, his occupation, and his location in an act of defiance against the Japanese justice system. It was not long before he faded from public life, never to be heard from again. At least, so far. This case shows that sometimes the nightmare never ends for the victims of killers such as cold-hearted Seito Sakakibara. Even long after they buried their children, the parents of Jun Hase and the parents of Ayaka Yamashita were still made to suffer at the hands of one man who took everything they had and then told the whole world just how he did it. Don't forget to tell me what you think about this case in the comments, and please like and subscribe to keep up with the world's disturbing crimes.